Uh, thank you, and uh, it's, it's great to be here at this ICT forum. Uh, I thought I'll speak briefly about uh, what it means to have a digital economy and a digital society. Now, I think one thing that the pandemic has taught us is that every part of our lives depends on some digital capability. Uh, we were all, many of us were working from home, so we worked from home remotely on our computers. Many of us were ordering from home because we couldn't go to a restaurant, so the food was coming home. We were buying things online. We were talking to our relatives and friends online. We were, so everything was really digital uh, in the way that we lived our lives. And I think the pandemic showed how important and how strategic uh, digital technology is to everyone's lives. At the same time, we have not had enough of a discussion on if, if it is so important to our society and our economy, we have not really had a discussion as to what should be the architecture of digital infrastructure in a country or a city in a way that it is inclusive, it's equitable, it's universal, and it allows everyone to participate, it allows market forces to compete, it allows innovation to flourish. So clearly the digital infrastructure the way it's architected or the way it's designed or the way it interacts with each other is a very, very important thing for us as societies to think about. And there's not enough conversation happening on those things. Now, we have done that in other areas. For example, go back, if you look at the airline industry, in some sense, your, your ticket is completely interoperable. You know, the, there are many of these alliances, Star Alliance or One World Alliance. And if you buy a ticket on Star Alliance, part of the flight may be on Air India, part of it may be on Lufthansa. And then they have code sharing, so they can put together three, four flights and create one ticket for you, and you may travel to two or three airlines. So interoperability is inherent to travel. Similarly, your mobile phone. When you have a mobile phone and you have a number, you have a, uh, the whole world has a dialing system, and you dial a number and speak to somebody in Germany, you don't know which telecom operator is using. So I may be using Airtel in India, he may be using Dutch Telecom in Germany, somebody else may be using Telenor in Norway, but they all interact with each other. In other words, somebody has thought through the idea that while we may have different providers of technology, we can actually make them all interoperate through each other. And that was how even the early internet was done. If you look at email, for example. You know, when I send an email to you, I don't care whether you're on Gmail or Yahoo or Hotmail, I just send it to you and you reply to me. So fundamentally, many, many parts of our lives are actually based on this principle that things that there may be different providers and operators, but we have to have a protocol to bring all these things together, and that's why the markets work. So markets work and competition happens, and you also create innovation, because in mobiles, for example, we have the concept of mobile number portability. So if I have a mobile number from supplier X, and supplier X, I'm not happy with them, I just have to go and switch it to supplier Y, and I can retain my mobile number, so somebody can always call me, he doesn't even know that I moved my number from X to Y. So these are all well-established principles we have, but we don't really have them in the digital world. Now, why is it that we don't have them in the digital world? First is that the digital world has moved at enormous pace. All the developments of the digital world in creating all these amazing companies and products and services have happened in the last 25 years. If you look at the original internet design, internet was designed through US government funding, it was designed and rolled out, it was used for things like email and all kinds of things. And then the next big thing that happened in the internet was the development of the World Wide Web or the HTTP protocol, which was actually built in Europe at CERN in Switzerland, funded by all the European countries and put out as a digital public infrastructure way back in 1989. And then we had the next big development in the internet was the mosaic or the browser, which allowed you to go easily from site to site that again was built at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, funded by the US, Science Found uh, the US Science Foundation. So fundamentally, all those pieces of the infrastructure of the internet were built with public money. And then of course, the private internet began with Netscape and then all the other companies came along. Now, now they become such a big part of our lives. But we have to think that if digital is going to be so important to our lives, we have to think of the architecture of digital in our lives, just like we have done in airlines, we have done in mobile phones, we think of in digital. Same rules apply. And that is part of what we have done in India, which is called the notion of digital public infrastructure, which is thinking through the interactions of our society and creating protocols that can allow people to talk to each other digitally 
and therefore we can create inclusive markets, open markets, competitive markets, include people into society, and so on. And we have been working on this for the last 15 years, and many of the things we have in India, like the Aadhaar project, which I led, 1.3 billion people have a digital ID, there's 80 million authentications a day, or, uh, NP or UPI, which is a payment system built by NPCI. Again, uh, I'm an advisor, Pramod here is an advisor, and this does 8 billion transactions a month, and is designed to go up to 1 billion a day, which allows today 300 million people to transact with each other, as well as make payments for things at merchants. And today we have 50 million merchants in India who use UPI, and often they are willing to take even a 10 rupee payment to buy, to buy some vegetables when you want to buy some vegetables. So this is democratization and inclusion of things at scale. And then of course we have the whole idea of data empowerment, which says that if a person can use his own data to improve his life, then, then you know, that's really creating value from technology. Now, to give you an example, I'll give you uh, how these digital public infrastructure affects me and affects each of you. So when I go to the airport, I usually order a taxi because it's, you know, the airport is so far. I say, let me take a taxi and not make my driver go up and down and all that. When the cab comes, he is sitting, when I sit in the cab, he has a vaccination certificate. That's a digital vaccination certificate with a QR code, which can be read, it's encrypted, it cannot be faked. I can read the QR code and make sure it's a real certificate. So a digital vaccination certificate is a digital public infrastructure goods in India, and India has issued more than 2.15 such billion certificates, and five other countries are using this piece of infrastructure, creating a, a credential, a verifiable credential. Now, when I look deeper at the vaccination certificate, I see that he has used his Aadhaar number to get the verification, to get the vaccination. So the second piece of the digital infrastructure where this person, along with a billion other people, has gone in with his Aadhaar number to get a vaccination. Then we go to the airport, we pass a toll booth. The toll booth has something called Fastag, and Fastag is an electronic way of, of debiting my account for paying for the toll. And I just drive smoothly through that point, and that taxi guy's account gets debited. Fastag is another example of digital public infrastructure, which does about 2.5 billion transactions last year, and is a huge source of revenue, because there's no leakage of revenue, all the money is collected. Now, when the driver uses the fast tag and pays for the ride, and then the balance in the fast tag account goes down, he replenishes it or loads it up with UPI. So that's the fourth example of something he uses to get, you know, using the infrastructure we have. And then when I reach the airport, I want to show my ID, and the, the guy at the gate wants my ID, and I pull out my digital locker on my phone and show him my other card or my driver's license. So that's the fifth example of digital infrastructure that we use. And then if I'm in a real hurry I'm a, and I'm at an airport where there's DG Yatra, I just load my, my boarding pass into my phone, I flash my boarding pass, do a face authentication and walk into the airport, and that's very, very fast. So just in the simple act of going from home to getting onto a plane, I've used six different pieces of India's digital infrastructure. And that is the power of creating such an infrastructure which everybody can use. Now, just as we have done it for ID and payments, can we apply this concept in other areas? And that is, for example, can we create a way to make e-commerce much more interoperable? Can we create a way to make mobiles, mob mobility much more interoperable and so on? And so just like we were able to build digital infrastructure for population scale usage of payments, ID, data, they also need to have a population scale capability or world scale capability to be able to make systems interoperate and unbundle activities in a, in, a, in a commercial transaction. And that is the whole idea of the Beacon Protocol. The Beacon Protocol essentially is a way to unbundle uh, things in different areas and define easy ways to transact so that you can make your design of uh, pr platforms much more inclusive and, and universal. And the Beacon Protocol is, is run as an open source project. It's run by a group of volunteers called as the Beacon Open Collective, and Sujit will talk more about that. It's stewarded and mentored by the FIDE Foundation, which Sujit is the CEO of. The idea is to really create a public good which everybody can use. 
Now, why is it so important to have this protocol? The reason is that, going back to what happened in the last 20 years, digital technology moved at a very high pace. And this was not, and it was often so fast that it was impossible for regulators and others to keep track of what is going on. And from a market perspective, everybody wanted to invest in something which is able to create value by creating a huge uh, winner-take-all model where all the transactions flow through you. And that's what has led to aggregators and so on. But if you can use the Beckon protocol to unbundle these things, then suddenly markets open up. I'll give an example of something because Beckon protocol is not, not just an idea. It is being used on the ground and by many people, including ONDC, Vibor is here. It's being used in Namayatri in Bangalore. And for example, in Namayatri again, I think, uh, Nats, I think they're all here. Uh, fundamentally, Namayatri does about, la last week did about 14,000 14, 14, transactions in one day. In other words, 14,000 people use the Namayatri platform to call a cab, call an auto rickshaw. And once they discovered the auto rickshaw, then they made a bilateral discussion with the auto rickshaw, and they made a, a you know, book the, ta book, the, book the auto and pay directly at the end of the ride. So this is a great example of how Beckon protocol has been used to create a better way of doing things so that the auto rickshaw guy makes more money, the consumer pays directly to the auto rickshaw guy, and you have a scalable architecture for, you know, tomorrow this platform will go to 25,000 uh, rickshaws, uh, uh, rides a day, or 100,000 rides a day. So fundamentally, it's a new way of thinking of mobility. In ONDC, again, you can bring in Instead of depending on just one or two uh, companies to provide your e-commerce, you can build a platform where thousands of small vendors can be on your platform. I think this week, uh, next week, there'll be a major launch of uh, such a hyperlocal platform on uh, ONDC, and that allows me sitting in my house to order some things I need in my house immediately from my shop next door, because the shop next door is on, on, on ONDC, I'm on ONDC, and we're able to transact. So fundamentally, this is, Beckon is a very important and strategic idea to be able to unbundle the way we do transactions. And it can be applied in many other areas. It can be applied in services, it can be applied in tourism, it can be applied in hospitality, it can be applied in skills. All these are potential uses. And this is very important because as we think about the future of cities, as we think about how to create more sustainability, as we think about enabling more public tra transportation, all these things matter because today in a city, I may use, uh, you know, sometimes I may use my own car, but often I take an auto rickshaw, in, at least in India, or I may use a taxi, I may use a metro transit, I may, I may take a bus. These are all discrete systems that don't talk to each other. And if I'm thinking of how to build a sustainable city, I don't even know how to make these investments for the future because so many of these investments are billions of dollars and take years to build, right? If you look at the metro, it takes maybe 10, 15 years to build a complete network and you're spending billions. And how do you, make, and therefore you're taking a big bet on the future of mobility of that city and where the traffic is going to be. But if you, if you instead of having these silos called metro and bus service and auto rickshaw service and cab service, if all these instruments of mobility were all connected to each other, then automatically they will find a balance of usage. So in other words, I may you know, get a call auto rickshaw, get into it, I'll have booked a, a, a ticket, I'll go to the station, that, that'll connect me to the, the same ticket carries me on to the metro at the other end is a taxi waiting for me and so on. So fundamentally, if you want to make these things much more fluid, much more interoperable, much more self-balancing, much more pr uh, protecting long-term investment, we need to make transactions uh, interoperable. So I think this is a big idea. The idea of Beckon is a big idea. It's really part of a whole range of things which have been created, certainly in India, which you call as digital public infrastructure. We think that it is very, very important in today's world for societies, cities, countries to think about what should be the architecture of the digital infrastructure because our lives depend on it. And we have to make sure that markets work. We have to make sure there's interoperability. We have to make sure there's competition. We have to make sure there's innovation. We have to make sure there's inclusion, which is not just for a few people, but a billion people should get access and so on. And therefore, many of the things happening here are towards the larger goal 
of creating a much more inclusive society where more people can participate, more people get economic benefits, more people can become part of the formal society. So thank you and all the best. Thank you very much.